excited to talk about this topic. Appreciate that y'all are still here. I was picturing me and David and the camera dudes. So uh, I, know, I know it's been a, a good week with a, uh, a, lot of, a lot of briefings. But this is an important topic to me. We have all the problems a large commercial multinational company has. Lisa mentioned 3.2 users. Many of them challenge uh, any of the security protocols you're, you're going to throw in such a distributed heterogeneous network. But we also have a unique requirement to defend our weapon systems in mission critical scenarios where minutes are arbitrating an engagement decision where two aircraft meet in the air and only one is going to leave. Those pilots need information they trust absolutely. They need systems that they trust. And those systems are a collection of many different networks, many different embedded and closed systems that have unique requirements with them. One unique thing about the ability to do the work we're talking about today, by, by day I work at DARPA, where I lead our uh, offensive suite of technologies. I'm also a reservist with Cybercom, partnering with, with DIUX on this work to build a defensive suite of, of technologies. DIUX Defense Innovation Experimental has a location a couple miles down the road here, reaching out to Silicon Valley with a group of folks who have a lot of background, getting things done, interfacing with industry. I'm proud to be part of, of their team, taking technology that we're developing at DARPA and pushing it into real systems, which I have a chance to talk about today. We have some challenges in the DOD, and I wanted to show an equation. The numerator side is going to be some positive components of the work that we do in the environment that we're in, and some challenges are going to be on the bottom. And the first piece, which motivates me every day, is the national impact of, of what we're able to do and the unique authorities we have to do an offensive mission, to build technologies, and to charge forward with the capability that, that we have. The other component is a set of very interesting technical problems, and the embedded systems problem is very unique in, in many ways and, and really challenging uh, from a lot of, of traditional cyber approaches, from, from penetration testing to automatic vulnerability discovery. We also have an incredible talent pool where we get to work with, some, some amazing folks that, that deal with everything you're about to see on the bottom of this equation and push forward uh, despite a, a bureaucracy that, as Lisa mentioned, can be difficult to work with, with rules that are uh, sometimes restrictive uh, to, to get things done. But we figure out how to do it, and we have the resources to make that happen. And one of the biggest challenges that, that we're facing and that we're building solutions for is what I might call patch latency. The idea that extreme vetting existed long before this administration as it concerned the patches that we bring into our system, we won't take a commercial patch and bring it in to mission critical systems. We're going to use our workforce to take significant look at everything, and that might mean we take a, a hit in time before we bring patches in, which is a, a risk balance that, that has to be understood. The next component is our own processes to secure our systems slow down the process to whether it's developing offensive or defensive technology to bring it forward. We might be talking multiple months just to secure a single computer for us to start, start working, which is always a challenge. And the biggest challenge, and this is a tech challenge that I'm directly taking on, but interested in any thoughts and any other work in this area, how do we measure the cyber vulnerability of our platforms? We have very strong disciplines to understand vulnerability in radar cross-section, vulnerability in structures, survivability against weapons and small arms fire. Those are defined sciences, but the ability to evaluate, if I take 10 lines of code and add it to my system, what does that do to the cyber survivability of the system is an unsolved problem. And also, in the absence of a solved science to explain the cyber regret surface of a, of a given set of code, we also rely on regression testing, which is naturally good to be doing unit functional integration tests as we push forward, but it alone is an insufficient surface to understand the, the full regrets of, of any system. Additionally, we have a big legacy code problem. B52 is going to be in service for over 100 years. It's going to be running code that is not in service any, anywhere else. We're talking ADA, for Jovial, code that, that is very, very low level and isn't built with modern type-safe interfaces and presents a lot of unique challenges with that as well. Just um, two efforts to talk about today. 
both with the purpose of, of hardening and understanding embedded systems in mission critical context. The first we're calling Voltron, which is an effort to take Cyber Grand Challenge tools. Again, cyber was the automated hacking tournament where machines fought each other. I, my job was to sit in the pit with the teams like, like David and his group and be human with them while the machines fought the, fought the game. We're gonna take those tools that were built for a sterile environment and we're gonna put them against real systems. That requires both a tool modification as well as some interesting work in, in virtualization to be able to operate in that context. That's going to produce findings. It's gonna produce things that we need to address. That's not why we're doing it. We're doing it to prototype a systems engineering discipline. Scary stories that might come as a result of that require us to win in cyber with a set of defensive technologies we wanna push into a candidate platform, and that's the harden up effort that we have below, which is to take a whole suite of defensive technologies we're building at DARPA, push them through the valley of death into a, into a real system. And this is the type of thing that DIUX is built to do, to take on a challenge like this and produce a prototype that makes it sufficiently concrete for our transition partners and the services to pull this type of capability in. Most important part for me, I've, I've been a program manager of probably 10 different programs, particularly in the Air Force, whether they're weapons programs or aircraft programs, and in each of those, we had a suite of predictive analytic tools. When it comes to the ability to understand your regret surface in front of a radar, we have method of moments and a suite of RCS prediction codes that tell us if we move a single gun turret on a ship, what does that mean at any polarization or frequency for that ship to to be able to evade detection in the ways we want to design the ship to do it. We can know every rivet on that ship and what its contribution to the survivability is. Bridges are the same way. I, I've been a part of a, a research group that looked at stress and strain curves in different stochastic environments going out 10, 20, 30 years on each load spar on a, on a structure. We had a perfect understanding of what that regret surface looked like of every design decision. And in aerodynamics, we can understand at the microcell level, Navier-Stokes paves the way to understand what the strange dynamics of vortices caused by a high-speed hydrodynamic ram. All these components have an engineering discipline associated with it. And what we have and we use are teams of hackers to come in and explain how things might not work, just like we did for the, the web-facing infrastructure, port 80 over the DoD, what are the vulnerabilities in that space? We found a lot. Lisa would be the first to admit that we haven't found all of them. How do we understand what that surface is like? How do we comprehend a distributed and, and heterogeneous surface? Most importantly, how do we operate in the domain we want to in, in the DOD? Just to give one example, fighter pilots, air-to-air -air combat, the ability for two aircraft to meet in the air, one flies away, is arbitrated over three basic events. The first is the detection of a target. This is generally what, what radars are for the ability to know someone's out there, and hopefully the ability to ID and determine who you're up against. The next important event is called an A-pole. To fighter pilots, this is the point where you can take a shot, missiles in the air, you can fly away, you can start ev evasive, defensive maneuvers at that point. Your A-pole is the distance between you and the target when you can take a shot at the target. And then the next event, and arguably the most important event because it's accomplished by some kinetics or a fireball, is the point where your missile makes contact with an adversary aircraft. Now obviously, fighter pilots would not be cool if they were up alone in the air. It's a race between two forces. It's arbitrated in minutes. And an adversary plane has to get to its F-pole before you get to his. And you can see in this example, we were able to get to the F-pole. The pilot was able to be successful, but not successful enough for what we want because the adversary was able to get to their A-pole, which means they could have launched a missile in the air, which could result in a, a very Pyrrhic victory. Bottom line of this is we understand the dynamics. It's complicated, six degrees of freedom, multiple weapons, multiple sensing modalities. The human element of combat is there, but this is the type of thing we understand in the DOD, and we can build and design systems in this space. In the cyber world, there's a similar kill chain but it's, di it's dilated over a much longer period of time. Certainly we have to develop software, we have to test it, keep those regression tests running in a continuous integration process as long as we can. Once we deploy a system, we don't rest, we, we keep hacking it, we keep understanding any potential flaws as it interfaces throughout its life cycle. And of course we're looking for any intrusions because there's a red side of this kill chain too where we know, at, Lisa mentioned the OPN brief, we know that intellectual property 
can be stolen. Once it is, attacks can be developed. And we want to be able to have our options and to understand any observables from this domain. Just like in the fighter domain, we want to be able to sense when an adversary is there, take decisive action, remove it, and move forward. The problem is, while you might be able to build a web application in a week and deploy it in a matter of weeks and sell the company in a year, the timeline of our weapon systems expands over tens and, and almost to uh, many tens of years, 100 years in the case of a, a B-52 aircraft. And during that cycle, we're going to batch our upgrades into what we in the Department of Defense call blocks. So before the blocks are upgraded, we're of course going to be taking process our software through multiple processes. And we've learned recently that it makes a lot of sense to bring in hackers. And as limited in supply as they are, they provide great insight because there are things that regression tests are, are never going to find. The problem is we're not the only one in the space. And our hackers aren't constrained in the same way that the red side might be, might be free of constraints that, that we have to sign up to. Additionally, as soon as they have information, they can start running the, the same tools we have, the same capabilities to look at any potential vulnerabilities in our systems, develop attacks before we even deploy and, and field our systems, and sometime after, if, if there were an intrusion, finding that intrusion in the case of OPM, that took months before we were aware that, that, any was in that anyone was in that system. After the intrusion, there has to be some alarm that goes out and then some period of, of mitigation which is a very difficult problem if you've got hundreds of, of assets deployed around the world, you're used to doing upgrades and, and block cycles, remediation is a non-trivial problem. And we don't just have one red hacker out there, there's a, there's a C, and this is clearly not the world we want to give that fighter pilot involved in the engagement I, I mentioned earlier. What we want is to operate on the time scale of minutes that we showed that we know how to arbitrate, how to work in that type of scenario. And in this sense, what we want to do is take the Cyber Grand Challenge tools, which can provide both an understanding of a surface, because it's a deterministic threat model that applies against a code base. And we want to apply that continually to the extent that our systems are being hacked without ceasing, that we can compare those together in a live modeling environment so that we transfer learn any weaknesses across our entire, our entire system. And we've seen that this is possible. John mentioned earlier in his talk about an engagement where one of the teams, Xandra, a team that comprised of UVA along with Gramatech, a company that does a lot of work with us, figured out its automatic reasoning system, found a vulnerability in OSTP SIM, deployed this against another team. The deployment, the exploit landed a matter of minutes later. Jima, a team from Moscow, Idaho, that uh, figured out how to, how to mediate this, this vulnerability, build a patch a matter of minutes later. Literally, I was sitting on a couch probably having a conversation about the, the merits between QEMU and lifting to LLVM, a five-minute conversation. During that time, unbeknownst to us, the machines were figuring out this type of interaction in real time and executing major CTF-type moves in a matter of minutes. This is what we want to take into our systems continually. DARPA released a press release right after this talking about the zero minute instead of the zero day. If we can operate in this time scale, there's clearly an advantage from an offensive st standpoint that if cyber warfare is arbitrated in minutes, we want to be able to have full options in this space. And for the defensive purpose, we want to be able to use these systems to continually run against all of our systems all the time and share that information. Now, for that to happen, we have to make two big tech investments. One is taking tools that worked in Cyber Grand Challenge. Cyber Grand Challenge was a sterile environment intended not to find any real vulnerabilities out in the world. We wanted it to be a public event. We wanted to push all the data to GitHub. We wanted the world to understand what happened and provide a sterile environment where the infrastructure itself was not going to be the main show of, of the contest. So we built a stripped down version of an operating system, seven system calls, 10 of thousands of lines of code instead of millions of lines of code. And so we need to go from the center of those axes and out towards the edges, making these systems viable in, in real environments. The other thing we have to do is build full virtual models of, of these systems. And there are two tech bases that enable this. One is advanced virtualization, where we can use dynamic translation, hardware acceleration, and pluggable components to build 
true cyber physical models of these systems, think QMU or Wind River, Simex, auto uh, industry does this for, for their vehicles. And we also want to use advanced instrumentation so we can apply everything from static and dynamic analysis tools against our systems, as well as checkpointing and debugging so we can save state and comprehend any results of, of fuzzing or other activity applied to these, these systems. But most importantly, what they allow us to do is after we do a model decomposition and we modify the tools to run in the environments where we need them to, to operate, we can build cyber physical models that we can then lift from, say to LLVM or AST or some intermediate representation that make them accessible to the tool suites that we then bring to bear. After we do that, we're able to transfer learn across multiple systems and generalize. So instead of a set of scary stories, we have a set of patches and real options that we can apply against our systems. Now, we don't want to do this just to find the so-called scary stories. We want to do this to demonstrate, again, that systems engineering discipline of how to comprehend, measure, and look at the overhead of the regret surfaces on our systems. The other thing we want to do, though, is put a bunch of technology into our system to be able to be impervious to the type of things that, that we might find in the first piece. And to do that, we have to add two components to the classical confidentiality, integrity, availability paradigm of cybersecurity, namely transparency and non-repudiation. Very important to us that we have full insight into what's in our systems and full knowledge of where all data flows came from and, and where they're going, full provenance inside the stack. To do that, we're going to look at a specific set of DARPA technologies. Love to talk about any of these from a, a whole suite of programs that, that we have that provide everything from the ability to control our data, to understand its, its legacy, to doing machine learning at a very low level inside our systems, to be able to detect any anomalies or provide enhanced attribution to where any, where any of the data flows might come from. And to this end, I've prototyped out, me and my team has prototyped out a, a, a system of complete security that starts from anti-tamper, root of trust inside the system, and then moves up the stack to higher levels where we're able to apply different components of formal methods to look at a, what a completely secure platform would be. And we're not going to try to engineer any real systems in the DoD, but we're going to use this as a north star to guide our efforts going forward and to provide technology insertion. Just an example, one, one technology we're going to push into this is a data provenance technology that uses a, a blockchain ledger with a Merkle tree to pass up, hatch, pass up hatches of the um, entire data flows inside the system and to use a timestamp to be able to provide full transparency inside the system. This is important for us because as we match it with the cyber reasoning systems we mentioned earlier, we can talk about real metrics that we're applying to our binaries. So if it's 10 million hours of, of a particular cyber reasoning system that we find absolutely no vulnerabilities from, we can sign that or we can patch it and sign it and have full provenance of that binary as it goes through the process over the next tens of years that are going to derive the time constants of, of our development. And we also want to bring as many formal methods components, just like John showed earlier in the Hackums program, where we're looking at building wrappers, essentially jacking up that, that building and adding formal properties to that system. In this sense, we have a whole effort going on looking at, at how to place low-level sensors inside systems to find what, what we would call uh, any trace of advanced persistent threats and to be able to share that information across the, the broadest context possible. So altogether, we're pursuing two different efforts. One is to take automation tools from Cyber Grand Challenge and provide predictive capability on complete cyber physical systems, giving us the ability to understand that we're going to directly apply into the hardening component and to essentially for us, we want cybersecurity to be as boring as physical security or structures, any, any engineering discipline. We should have the knowledge of knowing the design regrets of the decisions that uh, we're diving into. That's it. Happy to take any, uh, any questions on that.